The record of this nation's African-American servicemen and women is a heroic story draped in irony. Why, despite enormous injustice, did these determined individuals fight so valiantly for freedoms they themselves did not enjoy? The answer to this question can be found in the letters, diaries, thoughts and reflections of those who were there. Their words are relevant to every American and speak of courage, honor, duty, and sacrifice for love of liberty. I'm Halle Berry, and this is their story. Five years before the American Revolution, on March 5, 1770, angry Boston citizens confronted British soldiers who had been sent to enforce English tax laws. A black man shouted, be not afraid, and led the protesters into the fray. The Redcoats raised their weapons and fired. In that one volley, Crispus Attucks, an escaped slave, became the first man to die for a cause that would become the war for independence. Who set the example of guns? Who taught the British soldier that he might be defeated? Who dared look into his eyes? I place, therefore, this Crispus Attucks in the foremost rank of the men that dared. John Hancock. When Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death, Negroes accounted for nearly 20% of America's population. Most were slaves. I was born on the eastern shore of Maryland in the year of our Lord, 1753, in a state of slavery, and belonged to Francis de Shields. He was a colonel in Washington's army. I was with him through the whole course of the Revolutionary War. There, human blood ran down in torrents till the waters of the river were red as crimson. Revolutionary War veteran James Roberts. In the spring of 1775, England sent a detachment of 700 men to Concord, Massachusetts to destroy the colony's military supplies. Paul Revere passed the word that British regulars were coming and Minutemen, both black and white, were waiting for them at Lexington. Prince Estabrook was among those patriots who were wounded. He was a slave. At Lexington they did appear, arrayed in hostile form. And though our friends were peaceful there, yet on them fell the storm. Thrice happy they who thus resign into the peaceful grave, much better there in death confined than a surviving slave. Poet, soldier, preacher, Lemuel Haynes. Two months later, the British once again took the offensive. Free men of color were among the patriots gathered at Bunker Hill to stop them. England would eventually win the day but not before the militiamen, despite being badly outnumbered, inflicted devastating losses. Eyewitness accounts of that day are contradictory, but in 1818, historian and author Samuel Sweat would write, Among those who mounted the works was the gallant Major Pitt Caron, who exultingly cried out, The day is ours, when a black soldier named Salem shot him through and he fell. Writer, Samuel Sweat. George Washington took command of the Continental Army two weeks later and promptly called for volunteers. Black men, however, were specifically forbidden from enlisting. Neither Negroes, boys unable to bear arms, nor old men unfit to endure the fatigue of the campaign are to be enlisted. General George Washington. Among the assumptions were that blacks were too cowardly to fight that armed slaves would be a danger to their masters, and if they fought, then they must be freed. Still others believed their service to be undignified and beneath 
the great principles of the revolution. Is it consistent with the sons of freedom to trust their all to be defended by slaves? General Philip Schuyler, Continental Army. Not all the founding fathers agreed with those sentiments. John Adams noted in his diary, They say if 1,000 regular British troops should land in Georgia, and their commander provided them with arms and clothes, and proclaimed freedom, 20,000 Negroes would join from Georgia and South Carolina in a fortnight. John Adams. The English came to the same conclusion, and Lord Dunmore, the British governor of Virginia, issued a proclamation inviting slaves to join the royal forces. I do hereby declare all Negroes free that are willing to bear arms, for the more speedily reducing the colony to a proper sense of their duty to His Majesty's crown and dignity. Lord Dunmore. Despite the many obvious reasons to serve under the British, the Negro's primary loyalty was to the principle of liberty. A slave poet named Phyllis Wheatley expressed those sentiments in a letter, which was published in the Connecticut Gazette in 1774. In every human breast, God has implanted a principle which we call love of freedom. It is impatient of oppression and pants for deliverance. Poet Phyllis Wheatley. Alexander Hamilton held, such beliefs went to the heart of the revolution and pressed the Continental Congress to allow black men to enlist. I have not the least doubt that Negroes will make very excellent soldiers. An essential part of the plan is to give them their freedom with their muskets. This will secure their fidelity and animate their courage by opening the door to their emancipation. Alexander Hamilton. Desperate for soldiers, General Washington agreed. As the general is informed that numbers of free Negroes are desirous of enlisting, he gives leave to the recruiting officers to entertain them and promises to lay the matter before Congress, who, he doubts not, will approve it. General George Washington. During the long and bitter fight that was the American Revolution, five all-black units would shed their blood, the most famous being the 130-some men of the 1st Rhode Island Regiment. They received their baptism by fire at the Battle of Rhode Island. Samuel Harris was among them. The regiment to which I belonged was ordered to what was called a flanking position. It was opposed to them in a danger. They attacked us with great fury, but were repulsed. Again, they reinforced and attacked us again with more vigor and determination, and again were repulsed. Again, they reinforced and attacked us the third time with the most desperate courage and resolution, but a third time were repulsed. The contest was fearful. Our position was hotly disputed and as hotly maintained. First Rhode Island veteran, Dr. Samuel Harris. Slaves served the cause of liberty behind the lines as well. In 1781, the Continental Army, assisted by a French officer, the Marquis de Lafayette, was preparing to fight a decisive battle. The British commander, General Cornwallis, believed he would be victorious. What he didn't know was that in his dining room, mingling amongst his officers, was a black servant named James, who also happened to be an American spy. His information helped the colonists defeat England at the Battle of Yorktown. Lafayette would later write, This Negro spy properly acquitted himself with some important communications I gave him. His intelligence from the enemy's camp were industriously collected and more faithfully delivered. Marquis de Lafayette. After eight long years of war, America had won its freedom. The ideals of the revolution were permanently enshrined in a national motto, E Pluribus Unum, out of many, one. For some, that included blacks. Holding fellow men in bondage and slavery 
is repugnant to the golden law of God and the inalienable right of mankind, as well as every principle of the late glorious revolution. Maryland plantation owner Philip Graham. Southern political leaders disagreed and in 1787 made their views known at Philadelphia's Constitutional Convention. Religion and humanity have nothing to do with this question. The true question at present is whether the southern states shall or shall not be parties to the Union. If the northern states consult their interest, they will not oppose the increase of slaves, which will increase the commodities of which they will become the carriers. Constitutional Convention Delegate John Rutledge. The argument prevailed. When we, the people of the United States, finally ratified the Constitution, it promised to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, yet did nothing to eliminate slavery in the South. Some black veterans were reclaimed by their former masters as property. James Roberts was one of them. Honor, justice, and the hope of being set free with my wife and four little ones prompted me to return home. I was soon after separated from my wife and children and sold for $1,500. And now will commence the statement of my wages for all my fighting and suffering in the Revolutionary War for the liberty of this ungrateful, illiberal country to me and my race. Revolutionary War veteran James Roberts. In 1794, Eli Whitney unveiled his cotton gin. Within three generations, America's slave population would grow from 700,000 to 4 million. I would never have drawn my sword in the cause of America if I could have conceived that thereby I was helping to found a nation of slaves. Marquis de Lafayette. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.